Hello. Everything should be ready, I think. Okay, do you, do you see the desktop and hear me? Does everything seem okay? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. All right. Um, <coughs> okay. Uh, today we're going to finish talking about the multi-level feedback queue. And so I'm not sure if we'll start it today, but here's a reading assignment for the next section of the book. We're actually going to start the section on virtual memory. So chapters 12 and 13 are the beginning. The reading assignment is these two sections, 12 and 13. Okay, so we're, we're going to skip the last few sections on, on, on processes, the lottery scheduler and multi-core scheduling. So we won't, we won't do those two chapters. Okay. All right. So uh, now, oh, and, and you have a you you know you have a homework assignment. Now a, a, bu a bunch of you written me asking questions about the homework assignment. I haven't been able, had time to answer. I'm trying to get I'm trying to get to a answer everybody. Uh, I have a, a awful lot of stuff I have to be doing. So I'm I'm trying to get to all the the emails I've gotten, and, and I'll try. Yeah, hopefully in a day or two I'll be able to answer your, your questions. But it's just taking it takes a long time. I've got so many classes and so many students. It, and honestly, it takes just a long time to get through everything. So if you got, if you send me an email, you can follow up. Like if you, if you send me an email and you have more questions, keep you know keep sending them. I'll try to get I'll try to answer all of them. But you don't if you send me an email, don't feel like you can't send me another one. Yeah. So go feel free to yeah you know, if you have more questions or if something else has come up, if you figured something else out. So you know please keep writing and I'll try to keep answering it, 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 as quickly as I can. Okay, anybody got a question in, in class? Anybody got a question they want to ask about the program assignment right now? So is there something anybody would want to ask at this point? <laughs> Any question about this one that, you know, ask in class? I, I think I have a general question. How, what's the best way to uh, get the compute program 64.exe to um, to run in the our homework 3.c. That was basically the question I sent you in the email. I have more general, I mean, more specific questions in the email, but that's basically the I mean, how do you problem. How do you get this program to run? How do you get this program to run this program? Yes. Create process, like in homework assignment uh, two. Okay. So you you you'd still be you're going to use create process. You're going to have this function, this program. Where is it? Like here, when you say start the first group of processes, that's a loop that calls create process for each one of the processes. And it's always gonna, it's it's only gonna create that one process. You're always gonna run that one program with command line arguments. So you're gonna call create process and create process. When you give it this command line, you can put command line arguments right there in that command line. So if you just call compute program, it complains. It has to have a command line argument. So you know, you'll give it a command line argument in there. You know, you'll put a command line argument, you'll essentially just like I typed a command line here with the name of the program followed by space followed by 12, that'll be part of that string. Okay, so you'll run the you'll run this program using create process, just like you ran the programs and assignments uh, to uh, you know, the previous couple programming assignments, the uh, the, the, with the like the launcher. Okay, so is that what you mean? You know, use, so you should be able to copy the code kind of pretty much the way you did it in the launcher. You should be able to copy it to here, but you don't have multiple command lines. You only have 
this one command line with a parameter. You'll need to tell it how long it needs to run. You know, and that parameter comes from when somebody calls the, that's these numbers here. Yeah. See, those are the parameters for how long each, those are the parameters that go on each one of these command lines. Yeah. So this would be, this would be a six, yeah, one of these with a six second parameter, then one with a 12 second parameter, then one with a four second parameter. Okay, and that you just put it right on the command line with the name of the program. Okay, so the, the parameter to create pro, uh, compute program the parameter compute program will be part of the, will be part of this string. Okay, is that what you mean? That how to get how to launch compute program? Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. reuse reuse your code from from uh, from assignment two from the with the launcher. You know, your your create process is the only way in Windows that one program can run another program. See, that's how one program runs another program by calling create process. So you'll have to duplicate what you did in as the last assignment. Uh, you, you're not, of course, you're not. This time, you're not doing anything fancy with uh, with command prompts or anything like that. You just have to launch. You launch this process with a command line argument, okay? And the the um, the main thing you have to do, like in the last assignment, is you have to wait. Yeah. Yeah, you know, in the last assignment, you, but you only waited for CMD. Now you have to wait for all of these. Every time you launch, you launch multiple ones of these. When you launch multiple ones, you have to wait for one of them to finish. Like if you launch those three, the four second one will finish first. Okay, but you don't necessarily, you know, you don't wait for the four second one, you know, because it'll get real confusing if you try to know which one to wait for. Don't know which one to wait for. If you launch these three, you just wait on all of them. That's this wait for multiple processes function. Farther down here. Wait for multiple objects program. You wait, if you launch these three, you wait for all of them, but then this is the one that'll finish first. So you have to read the documentation how to wait for multiple objects. Don't don't try to say, oh, I launched these three. This one will be the first one that finishes, because when you when if you launch these three, this will be the first one to finish. But then you'll launch a five second job in its place. Suppose you have three CPUs. You'd launch these three. The four second job would finish first. It'd be replaced by a five second job. Now you have to figure out who's going to finish next. Well, it's not so obvious. The five second job will come after the four second job. It turns out that that would mean that the six second job is going to finish next. But then this five second job after the four second job would finish before the 12 second job. Your program should not be doing calculations like that. You know, that, that would be crazy to try to keep track of which is the process that's going to finish next. You just launch a bunch of processes and wait on all of them. Let the operating system figure out which one finishes next using wait for multiple objects, where was it? Using wait for multiple objects. You can wait on as many things as you want. You know, and it'll, it'll tell you which one finished. It'll wait, you know, if you're waiting on, if you're waiting on these three processes, it'll, it'll know which one finishes first. It'd be the four second one, but it'll tell you which one finished. It'll tell you which one. Then what you'll do is you'll, that process will be terminated. You'll launch the five second, along with these guys that are still running, and then you'll wait for six, 12, and this one. Okay, now after this one is finished, there's only two seconds left in this one. There's eight seconds left in this one, and you launch this one with five seconds. So the next one to terminate will be that one, but you don't worry about that. You just call wait for multiple objects with this one, this one, and that one. And then when the next one finishes, then you launch that one. Whichever one finishes next, then you launch that one. So, so the, the, it, uh, you can reuse a, a, some code from assignment two because you're using some of the same ideas. You're create processes and you're waiting, except the waiting is more complicated now because you're waiting on multiple objects, not just one. 
So you have to read how to determine which one, if you're waiting for five objects, how does the operating system tell you which one completed? And that's got to do with this return value. The return value, you, you pass this function an array of handles. So you read this as a, see, you have to, you know, notice it doesn't say array of handles. It's a pointer to a handle. But as we said many times, arrays are the same thing as pointers. So when you point at a handle, you're really pointing at the first handle in the array of handles. So that is an array of handles, okay? Now, and this is how long that array is. See, remember, C arrays don't know how long they are. So this is the length of that array. This thing is an index in that array. It's the index of which handle finished. If, this, if, there's, five, if there's five handles in this thing and you're waiting on all five of them, suppose the fourth one is the one that terminates this thing will be fourth. That's how this thing tells you in your array of handles, which is the one that completed, okay? And uh, we're not actually really using these two parameters here, okay? So we're actually only needing these two parameters here, the handle, or the array of handles and what to wait for, how many handles are in that array, and then you get back which one of them is the one that terminate, that, that completed. So that you get an index into that array of which one that got completed. Okay. All right. So so that's you know, that's how this thing tells you which one. If you launch multiple, if you launch multiple processes and you want to wait on all of them. So if you've got these three launched and you're waiting on which one finishes first, you put the handles to those three processes in an array and you call wait for multiple processes with that with the pointer to that array of three handles, and it'll tell you which one, either index zero, index one, or index two. In this case, it'd be index two, index, yeah, it'd be index two in the array that terminated. Then, you'd re then when you'd launch this guy, you'd have to replace this guy's handle with this guy's handle. You know, this guy will be done, so his handle will no longer be good anymore. But then when you call wait, when you call for a wait, you have to, you're still gonna use these two handles, but then you need that handle. So you need to replace a handle in your array, okay? And then a tricky part is, suppose you're waiting for three processes. This process finishes, replace them with this one. Now you're waiting for three processes. This process finishes, you replace them with this one. And now you're waiting for this one, this one, and this one, three processes, okay? This one terminates, now you're only waiting for two processes. So now you have to adjust the wait. You're not waiting for three processes anymore. You're only waiting for two processes. When this one terminates, now you're waiting for only one process. You don't switch to wait for single process. You still use wait for multiple processes, but now your array has only got one thing in it. So this array is gonna shrink. As, as you get towards the end of the program, you'll eventually be waiting on two processes, then one process. So you got to make that array shrink. Okay. So for a while, the array will be a constant size. You, if you've got five CPUs, you're going to be waiting on five processes. But then when you get towards the end, there aren't more processes to run. So you'll go from five processes to four processes, to three processes, to two processes, to one process. Yeah. So the, the, the array will shrink at the end. Okay, All right. So that's one of the things you have to be uh, careful about. And that, that's explained in here that you have to shrink the array as the number of processes is decreasing towards the end. You got to make sure that the array shrinks with it. I'm trying to remember. There's a. It, there's a. Somewhere in here, it, it it reminds you that this array this this array is shrinking. I don't remember where it. There's a paragraph in here where it remi where you have it points out that you have to keep track of the size of that array. Towards the end, the array will be shrinking. It's only towards the end where the array shrinks. It, at the beginning, the array is fixed size, and then as long as, as long as all your CPUs are full, the array is is full. 
But then as you get towards the end of the program, I don't remember where it is. I don't remember where it is. Yeah, but yeah, that's one of the important tricks in this. And that's why I'd say that you have to write this program in stages. Is where I point out, you know, that trick of shrinking the array is something you can wait till you've got a lot of the code working. That's a good example of something that you don't want to do right away. You want to get this, you want to, and this, if you think about this example here, you want to be able to get to where you've got those three running and then just let O3 die out. Don't even worry about these two. Suppose you have this, this is, you want to run this with three CPUs. Get these three running and then wait for them to die off, okay? By waiting for the three of them to die off, you have to solve the problem of a shrinking array, you get that shrinking array, but in a simple situation, you're not doing, you're not trying to do two things at once. You're not trying to shrink the array as you schedule new processes. So just like at the beginning, schedule these three, then wait for the four second one to terminate, then wait for the second second one to terminate, then wait for the 12 second one to terminate. Just do that first. That would be like your first benchmark, your first milestone, be able to launch the initial bunch of processes and let them die off one at a time. Because that will need to solve the problem of shrinking the array. But you're solving it in a simple case, not in a more complicated case. Okay. You, you know, so that's what I mean by try to think through this assignment and try to come up with a strategy of solving it step by step. You cannot write the whole program and debug it. Yeah, it won't work. It'll just be a nightmare to write the whole thing and then debug the whole thing. You can do it. I mean, I shouldn't say you can't. You can do it, but it'll be it'll probably take you twice as long. If you do it that way, it'll take way longer to do it. Yeah, but if you if you think of it in terms of chunks of code that need to be written and get one 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 uh, feature done at a time. You can, it's, it's better to be working on only one feature at a time than to try to put all the features in there and get them all fixed at once. You can't debug all the features at once, okay? So, so the feature of, of waiting, of letting the processes die out one at a time, you can do that early. You, know, you, you could do that, right? You could just do that at the beginning. I think that's actually probably a better time, a good time to do that. Now, the other, another strategy would be just worry about if you've got, you know, launch these initial ones and then just replace this one here. Wait for that one, wait for the first one to finish and replace it with this one. Okay, that doesn't require shrinking the, the array, but it does re require replacing one item in the array. This one terminates, it gets replaced by that one. You could do that first. Okay, that now that just, just get one of them to be replaced. Launch the initial three and worry about a fourth one, not even a fifth one, just the fourth one. Get that working. Yeah. Get it working so that you can replace one of the items in the array of, that you're waiting for. So you know, it's up to you to kind of think of a, a strategy for breaking the problem into steps, but you can't do the whole thing at once. Okay. All right. What about other questions? Did we, anything else come up about, about these? Anything else? Any other question? Do you have a general question about What's going on in here? Remember, you can run the demo program. Okay. And yeah, uh, if you run the demo program, yeah, you know, it tells you it need it needs command line arguments. Like, you know, I'm gonna run uh, a three second job. Well. Okay, you know, six, 12, four. Now here I, here I haven't set the affinity yet. So if I want to, like if I want to test this thing and I want it to run the six, 12 and the four, remember I go over here, start up task manager, find that 
command prompt in the task manager. Now I have two command prompts. Whoops. I have to figure out which one's which. Oh, yeah, my Windows machine re, re I, my Windows machine did a major upgrade the other day. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you, you know, Windows has become strange. You don't buy new Windows anymore. It just upgrades it. So I, my machine did a major upgrade and I have to reset all kinds of stuff now. Like my task manager is not set up right. You know, the, the major upgrade changed a lot of things on the operating system. It's a little bit annoying. So like this is I'm my task manager is now back to its default layout. This is not the layout I own, I ever use. This is default layout of task manager. So I don't even have the like I now I have to go back and turn all I have to turn I um I have to go back to select columns. Like I never use this uh, user access control column. So I need to find that and turn it off. Now I want the command line column because I always use the command line column. And I have to find the command line column and turn it back on. But it's kind of weird. Windows, when it does one of these major upgrades, you, you know, it. This is why people want to disa disable this stuff. That Windows won't let you disable it anymore because it can make some pretty big changes to your machine. Okay, I want to turn on that. Um, I need page fault delta. You see, I need a command line to see, it helps me figure out which one of these CMDs is which. Um, oh, I can't even tell. They're, oh, I have, do I have two of them open in that folder? Oh yeah, I opened two in that folder. Yeah, I didn't even, so let me close one of them. Yeah, I had two of them open in that folder. See, the command line helps me see what's going on. So I had two C, CMDs open in that folder. See, all right. So now, now I can set the affinity to this thing to run on three CPUs, okay? So I give it three CPUs. So I'm doing, I'm thinking of this example here with one, two, three, four, five processes, but three CPUs, okay? So if I was, if I was building up the program at this point, maybe I wanted to just launch those three and completely ignore those two. That would be my first step, just get it to launch those three. Then let it get, wait for it to, let, let it launch those three and wait for four to finish, then wait for six to finish, then wait for 12 to finish. Like right now, if I launch those three, notice it launched three. See, only three got launched because I only gave it three CPUs. The, there is the one that finished first. Okay. See how it's, re as one replaces, as one, now see, now it's got only two to wait for. Now it's only got one to wait for. Okay. All right. So, you can test your program step by step. At first, launch three, then actually check that you can launch four. Like first, you should be able to launch three. And if I go now and change the affinity, one of the things I would want to test is that I can, if I go here to change the affinity, that I would only launch two. Not even worry about waiting. You know, the first thing you might do is just do you get the right number of things launched? Okay. Now my program should only launch two of these things. Okay. And it only launched two of them. See, there's the schedule in the background. It launched two. That's one of the things you want to check. Are, are you launching the right number? Okay. Just so first get it to launch the correct number. That requires it to check its affinity mask and count how many CPUs are in the affinity mask. Okay, so that'd be kind of step one that you could test your program that it's that it reads the affinity mask and launches the correct number of processes. Don't even wait for them, just launch them. Okay, then after you're launching the correct number, start waiting for them, but just wait for all of them to finish. Or if you want, you could wait for the first, you could either wait for all of them to finish, which will require going from three jobs to two job to one job, or you could just wait for the first one to finish and see if you can replace it. Either one would be a good second step. Yeah. After you've launched the initial, if you've got three CPUs, you launch three processes, then either wait for all three of them to finish or, or wait for the next, for one of them to finish, the first one to finish and see if you can replace him. 
Okay, I'm not sure which would be easier, which would be a better second step. I think maybe waiting for them to terminate would be the, yeah. You know, but it could be, yeah. You know, it, it it's probably about the same. Either wait for them to ter to terminate one at a time, or wait for the first one to terminate and replace him. Okay. Okay. And then if you want, then after you've replaced one, you could try to replace the next one. Wait after you've after you've let one of them die and replace them. You may not need to, You may not even need to make any changes when the second one dies and you replace it. So you can just try. You can see how that works out. Okay. And then eventually you need to get. Now, if you uh, suppose you did the code where this one is re, like this one dies and this one is replaced, but you haven't taken care of the queue shrinking yet, the the uh, array shrinking. Your program might crash at that point. That's okay. Yeah, if your program gets to a point where it, it's trying to do something that hasn't been implemented, your program might crash okay, until, until you implement that feature. Okay, so that's part of the design step. You know, if, if you're working on one feature and another feature hasn't been implemented yet, your program might do something weird. It, may be cra it might crash or it might just ignore something. That's okay. You know, get the feature you're working on working, then worry about the next feature. Okay, and you know, don't try to do two features at once. That's that's where things. I mean, sometimes two features at once, maybe you can do. Yeah, you know, maybe you can simultaneously work on getting two features working at once, not more than two features at a time. Usually, you're told to design programs so you just work on one feature at a time. Get one thing working in your code at a time. Though, so if things are intertwined, it might be okay to work on two features at a time, but not not all of the features at once. Okay, all right. All right, so use the demo program to give you a guide on how things should work. You know, keep the demo program in, in front of you and, and compare yours to the demo. Use the demo program to give you a little bit of guidance on how it should behave, how it should behave, and maybe give you a sense of like what you could try to uh, um, work on next, what you might want to work on next. Okay. Any other, any question? Any anybody got anybody think of anything else about this stuff they want to ask now? Like I said many times, it's a really challenging program. It, you know, it's not lots of code. You know, it, it's only a couple pages of code. It's not a long program, but yeah, you know, it's a it's a sophisticated program. You're you're doing real programming here. You know, this is way closer to you know this is very close to like. Like real world programming, you're juggling quite a few ideas in one program, which is, you know, people don't write baby programs and make millions of dollars. You, know, you just don't make money off of trivial programs. So you, at some point you wanna make money, you have to start getting used to writing things that do something. Yeah, you know, and this is, this really, this is a scheduler. This is a, this is a small scheduler. It really does something. And this is still a baby, from the point of view of scheduling, this is a trivial baby scheduler, but, uh, yeah, it, it from the point of view of you writing the code yourself, it's a pretty good chunk of it's a pretty good project. Okay, and like I said, you know, if you you can work on it with somebody else, you can you know two people. This is a good this is a good assignment for two people to work on together because you bounce ideas off each other, and somebody might notice a bug that the other person doesn't notice. You know, when things get harder like this in the real world, people work in groups. You know, this would be something that would usually be worked on in a group by a, at least a couple people together. Okay. All right, any last question? Any other question about this stuff? Okay. Um, and and you've got to read the documentation. That's what programmers do. They read the documentation. I mean, you just spend a lot of time doing that. You know, the, the documentation is, you know, once you got out of college, you don't have textbooks anymore, but you always have the documentation. Yeah, and and um, somebody sent me a link. You know, somebody in the class sent me a link earlier in the semester of a really cool website. This is a website where somebody gathered documentation for a massive number of libraries all in one place. It's kind of neat. Yeah, it's kind of useful. See, just a huge number of very popular modern libraries. They they pooled all their documentation into one place. It's, it, ma it makes it kind of interesting. Yeah, whoops, see, and there's you know, some of it. Uh, I think actually you have to turn, oh, I think, uh, I forget how this website works. I think you have to turn on, you have to load some of the documentation ahead of time. I can't remember. Okay. Yeah, see, there's all of HTML documentation, the DOM document. But, but I mean, why would somebody do this? 
because as a programmer, having all the documentation in one place is really good. You know, it used to be that we would have all this stuff on our hard drive. It used to be you had to, you had to like go buy this stuff. I mean, when, when uh, there was a time when I had a stack of books on my desk because the only documentation was in books and the public, Microsoft made a lot of money selling books of their documentation. They actually made you pay quite a bit for it. You, you, have, you don't realize how, how much progress we've made. Uh, 20 years ago, you actually paid like 50 bucks for a book that would give you the Windows documentation, like, like this stuff here. You'd pay $50 for the book that had that in it, okay? And, uh, but you know, I would have a stack of books on my desk where I would have the documentation that I was currently working on. You know, so I would have a stack of like if I needed HTML and JavaScript and 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 up, you know one of these others, I would have those books. Now that's why somebody put them all in one place. Somebody thought it was nice to have them all in one place. Okay, but that's what because that's what people do. You have to spend a lot of time familiarizing yourself with the documentation of whatever libraries you're using. These are web-based li these are libraries that have to do mostly with um, HTML and, and um, programming on the web. So these are not systems libraries. So even all these, with all these libraries in here, that's very much leaning towards web development. If somebody was doing systems programming, you know, they'd have a completely different set of libraries probably. Yeah. But, the, but that's what people do. You know, they, uh, they read documentation a lot. So, you know, you, you gotta get kind of used to, and each company has its own way of doing documentation. Microsoft style is different than Linux's style. Here's the Linux documentation here. This website here is the Linux man pages. So uh, every page here looks a little bit like every page here. They're very similar, but see the syntax of, and parameters of a function here you go. Um, here's the equivalent of create process in Linux, it's called fork. Okay. Yeah. You know, so this page here is very analogous to reading this page here, but it looks very different. Microsoft has its own style. Linux has its own style. Okay. So uh, if you're doing Linux systems programming, you spend all your time in the man pages. The man man stands for manual. The man pages. So this this is the official Linux man page website. So these are web pages of the man pages that come with the Linux operating system. Linux always came with this documentation. Windows, you had to go buy it. Like I said a minute ago, Windows did not come with this documentation. When you bought a copy of Windows, you didn't get this documentation. When you buy a copy of Linux, or when you download a copy of Linux, this documentation actually is on the hard drive with Linux. It's always was there. Now it's available as web pages. You had to buy this documentation. And Microsoft sold it for quite a bit of money. Back when you had to buy it, it was not cheap to buy this documentation. They sold it through their bookstore. You bought these big thousand page books for $50, $60 of a volume, okay? So, but there, there's a di two different styles of, uh, see how it tells you what include file to use. Where is it? Well, I can't remember where it's, it's here. It has to tell you what include file to use also. I'm, I'm not, I, just, I must have passed it up here. You know, they tell you what include file to use. And uh, here's the signature of the function. Here's the signature of the function. Very short signature. There's the signature of the function. There's the signature. Notice the difference. Create process in Windows needs those parameters. Create a process in Linux. One parameter, no, actually zero parameters. That's a void function. Yeah, it's you can't get a more uh, dramatic difference in 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 uh, style than the difference between fork and create process. They create process takes about a, 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 a it takes ten parameters which point to complicated data structures. In Linux, you call fork with no parameters, and that creates a new process. It essentially creates a blank process. Yeah, it, yeah it, it, it's a completely different point of view than Windows. It's incredibly different how, how Windows has one whole completely different way of thinking about creating a process and Linux has a completely different way. See, 
create a new process. And, you know, here, notice, create a new process. The documentation starts exactly the same way. Create a new process, create a new process. This one needs hundreds of parameters. This one needs zero, zero parameters. You just call fork and you get a new process. Very different style, very different thinking about design. It's not clear that this is way better. I mean, this, this, this create process is very powerful. You can do a lot with it. It's complicated to use, but you can do a lot with it. This one, its power is in its simplicity. It's, it's like you either go one whole hog one way or you go whole hog the other way. The beauty of this is in simplicity. If you learn how to use fork, it's actually pretty amazing how much you can do with it because it's so simple. And if you learn how to use create process, you can do a lot with it because it's so complicated. And, and it's, you know, they have their they have their strong points and their weak points, but the strong point here is is the complicatedness. You can do almost everything you could think of with, with create process. Here in Fork, the simplicity ends up being elegant, but everything you do over here with create process, you have to find a different way to do it with Fork because Fork takes no parameters, okay? Very different, but yeah, create a process in one operating system, create a process in another operating system. And you start seeing how people think. You know, how, do, how do these people think versus how Microsoft? It's not surprising that Microsoft came up with a complicated point of view and Linux came up with a simple point of view. They, 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 that permeates the whole design of almost everything in these operating systems. Microsoft builds complicated, powerful things and Linux builds simple things that you can piece together. They try to make everything as simple as possible, do as little as possible, and you piece them together like a big jigsaw puzzle. Here, they give you big hammers, you know, big, they give you big tools that if you give it enough parameters, it can do almost everything you need in that one tool. So this is a world of multifunction tools, big complicated multifunction tools. And this is a world of simple tools like a fork, a, a screwdriver and a hammer, okay? Yeah, and it, it's interesting, you know, different design worlds, different design thinking, okay? But you spend a lot of time, you're gonna need to read the documentation. You really have to get used to the idea that you plow your way through this documentation, which is not easy to read. I mean, I'll be, you know, I'm not, not saying that this is a breeze to read. It's really, you know, read it and read it and read it over again, you know, play around with it. But, you know, that if you go back to this site, some of these are very well written and some of them are horrible, but there's the documentation. You know, some of them are great. Some of them are not. Oh, these were all disabled, I guess. See, these are the ones that are live and you can load different ones somehow. So these are the ones that come loaded automatically. And then you could load these other ones. But yeah, some of these are really easy to read and some of them are, some, some have a reputation of being very well done and some have a reputation of being kind of sketchy or vague or hard to uh, figure out. Okay, all right. So now let's go back to the scheduling stuff. Okay, now we wanna finish multi-level feedback queue and we're almost done with it. Okay, so there's just a couple of things th th left to say actually. There's not that much to say. Oh, oh, okay, that was, I wanted to open the picture. I keep opening the wrong thing. I want to open the picture. Okay. I mean, this picture describes it really well. Okay. Now, there's a couple details. I was reading about multi level feedback queue in our textbook and a few other textbooks. And there's a couple details here that vary from different people's point of view to, uh, okay. Here's what's always the same multi level feedback queue has a bunch of queues where the there's a high priority queue and a low priority queue. The time quantum gets longer as you go farther down the queues. So you have a very short time quantum for the queue, for the processes in this queue, a little bit longer time quantum here and very long time quantum when you get to the bottom, okay? okay so, the, so everyone has multiple queues with the time quantum growing as the queues get more, up. well, lower priority. I'll, we'll think of these as going down as lower priority. This is high priority, this is low priority. Now, here's one thing you have to worry about. Notice I made zero the, the highest priority and I made four the lowest priority. In the world of labeling this stuff, half the world does it one way and half the world does it the other way. Half the world makes zero the highest priority queue 
and then Q1 would be below it in priority, but it's higher in number. Other people make this would be Q4, 3, 2, 1, 0, because they'd want the high priority Q to be the higher number Q. They want the high priority Q to be the higher number Q. Well, half the world does it one way and half the world does it the other way, okay? And you always have to look at people to check their doc. Whenever people use priorities and they give them numbers, look carefully to see if a higher number is a higher priority or a higher number is a lower priority. Here, I'm using higher numbers for lower priorities, okay? Not, and that's actually, you know, it's half, half of one, half dozen of the other. Six to one, yeah, half the world does it one way, half the world does it the other way. There's no real consensus in this. There's something nice about making Q zero, the highest priority Q. Yeah, and then if I wanna add a priority, see, see the advantage of this is if I added a priority, I'd be adding a, 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 a low priority Q here. Okay, so that would be Q5. If I was doing the other ordering, I'd have to order, I'd have to renumber all these. If I added a new Q and I added, there was a, a, a sixth Q, then the highest priority Q would have to be changed from zero to six. So that's got a disadvantage to it. See here, if I decide to increase the number of Qs, the new lowest priority Q would just come in as number five. None of these Qs would change their numbering. If you do it in the other numbering, I don't like it that way because then when you add a Q, you have to renumber all the Qs. Okay, so I, I think that's a disadvantage to that other, to that other numbering sch scheme. So I prefer to use zero for the highest priority Q, okay? Because if I add a new Q, it's gonna be down here at the, at the a new lower priority Q. It doesn't make sense to add a new higher priority Q because this is the highest priority. It doesn't make sense to say, oh, I have a new priority Q that's higher and it's, it's the new zero. Yeah, it wouldn't make sense to have the new zero, but it would make sense to have a new Q5. All right, so that's one thing you have to check is these numbering, the, the way you number the cues can, can be confusing. Okay, so everybody has a, 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 the ready queue is really multiple cues with different priority. The time quantums increase as you go to lower priority cues. Okay. Now, what varies is how you move processes from one queue to another. Everybody, in every description of this algorithm I looked at, everyone agrees that when a process uses up its whole time quantum, it moves to a lower level, okay? If a process uses its, when, when it uses up the time slice, it moves down one level, okay? Everybody agrees on that. Now what, now what if you block and then when you're unblocked, you come in? Where should you come in after you've unblocked? If you look in the literature, in the textbooks, they actually have three different schemes. The scheme I said was when you unblock, you get boosted to the highest priority. The idea is that if you did an IO operation, you're probably gonna do more IO operations. So we might as well put you in the short queue so that you can just launch your IO operations over and over again. So you go straight, if you, if you block to do an IO operation, you come out of the block right to the top queue. Some books say that when you come out of a block queue, you move up one priority, not, you know, so you move down one when you use up a time quantum and you move up one when you issue an IO operation. So if you were down here and you issued an IO operation, when you'd unblock, you'd go up one. That if you issued another IO operation, when you unblocked, you'd go up one. Okay, that, 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 that accomplishes the same thing. Instead of you getting a, a, a boost up to the highest priority right away, you have to kind of work your way up the ladder. Okay, so some books describe it as when you unblock, you go up one level in priority, not to the top. Okay, another, some books actually describe a kind of, a, I think kind of a complicated thing. When you unblock, you stay in the same queue. Some books describe it as when you unblock, you go back to the queue you came from. Okay, so if you use up a time slonum, you drop down, but if you do an IO operation, you stay where you are. Okay, but that seems to defy the point of view that if you issued an IO operation, you should be going up. Yeah, you know? so I'm not sure why anybody would do that. You know, the intuition is that if you issued an IO operation, well, that gives you, you should become sort of like the, your short job. You should move up in the line. You should at least move up one notch. But some books describe it as you stay where you are. Okay, you drop down when you use up a whole time quantum and you stay where you are if you issue an IO operation. Now, the trouble with that, a real problem with that, and actually a problem with this whole thing is 
suppose you have like five processes down here and a hundred processes up here issuing IO operations. These have higher priority than these. It could be there's always somebody ready to issue an IO operation. If you have a mixture of like hundreds of IO bound processes and a few compute bound processes, you could, these guys can down here can starve. Okay, this, this is a problem of starvation. This queue never empties because there's so many processes doing IO that this queue, it may, it may never be full. They're, they're, most of the IO bound ones will be over here blocked, but it could be there's a steady stream of unblocking IO operations that keep this queue from ever emptying. And so anybody down below starves. So the textbooks all say that every once in a while, and they, you know, they really leave ambiguous how often this is, but every once in a while, all these queues are flushed up to the top level. That's to prevent starvation. And then that's used in these algorithms where if you, the ones that say, well, if you do an IO operation, you stay at the same level, you're gonna stay at that level until it's time where everybody gets boosted up. Now that might be, it might be that in some implementations that turned out to be a more efficient way to do things. I, I don't really don't know, but some books describe it that way. They all say that at some point you need to bump everybody up to the top because otherwise you have a starvation problem. You know, if you have too many IO bound processes and too few CPU bound processes, the CPU bound processes can get starved because there's always somebody up here or there's always somebody in these queues over here. It could even be that you have a mixture of IO bound processes and you, you know, there's always something in these queues and the ones down here at the bottom never run. Okay, so all descriptions of this algorithm say that at some point, and that some point could be every second, every two seconds, every three seconds, who knows? You know, they really, it, it's, it's not clear how often it should be done. The books usually don't even say how often, but it's every once in a while, everybody should get put up to here, into the top to prevent starvation. The long running ones will work their way back down, but they'll, they'll use up CPU time as they work their way back down. You take one of these guys and put him up here, he gets 30 milliseconds, then he drops down here, then he gets 50 milliseconds, then he'll drop down here, he'll get 70 milliseconds. So he'll pick up some CPU time on his way down. Now, once he gets back down here, he may get stuck there and starve for a while, but then at some point there'll be this thing where everybody moves up to the top. So, so you at least give these guys some chance to get some uh, work done. Another answer to that problem of starvation is the following. It's kind of a, yeah. suppose you have lots of IO bound processes and a few CPU bound processes. So the CPU bound processes are tending to starve. One answer is, why are you running your computer that way? You know, why are you running your online ordering system at the same time you run your uh, weather prediction software. You, know, you shouldn't be running extremely compute bound software on the same computer you're running very IO bound software. Very IO bound software would be like an order processing system. Your online system that's just got people, you know, your web server would be doing, your web server would be amounting to processes to do almost nothing but IO. You don't run a weather forecasting program on the same computer you're running your web server. That's just idiotic. You, know, you can't ask the operating system to somehow solve that problem for you that you wanna run the weather forecaster on the same computer you run the, uh, the, 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 the web server. So the, the operating system is not supposed to solve all the problems, okay? So if you really see that you've got processes starving, it might be that you really didn't do a wise job of deciding who's gonna run your, your programs. You know, you, and in the real world, it's very common to give each computer a role like the web server is not gonna be running the inventory program or the forecasting pro. You know, every company might have a program that does forecasting, does data analysis, that tries to decide how, many, uh, how much inventory they need. The data analysis program should not be running on the same co computer that the web server is running on. It'd just be dumb to do that. The data analysis software would be very compute bound, doing a lot of statistical calculations on large amounts of data. So a data analysis program would be very compute bound. A web server is very IO bound. You, those should almost never be on the same computer. Okay? So, so this algorithm can only work up to a point. And then at some point it's up to you to think about how you're using your computer. Okay? So the, the idea that 
all these cues should be flushed to the top level is pretty common. Almost all books describe it that way, that you, know, you do have to worry a little bit about, about starvation. So every once in a while, everybody goes up to the top, okay? Right. So, so the, the, the commonality is if you use up a time quantum, you drop down because you're a longer running job. And you, you should be, oh, and then, you know, why, you know, the intuition for short jobs move up and long jobs move down was this other files. That, um, oh, the other, I didn't put them, oh, let's see. I think I put them up on the website. I didn't put a link to them. They're in the folder on scheduling. These two files here. They're in the school, they're in the folder on scheduling. I forgot to put a link to them. Okay. Remember, this is an important example. If you've got four CPU bound processes and you time slice them this way, context switch, context switch, context switch, context switch, context switch, context switch, context switch con you're wasting a lot of time on context switches. If these are CPU bound processes, so they're going to always use up their CPU, their time quantum, always use up their time quantum, you'd be better off running them this way. Real long time quantum, real long time quantum, real long time quantum. You know, they're going to end up taking the same amount of time. Actually, this will be a little bit faster because you're going to waste less time on context switches. Context switches themselves take quite a bit of time. Roughly on a modern computer, the context switch might be 5% of the time quantum length, something like that. Yeah, some, yeah it's, a, it's the context switch is a measurable amount of time. It might be even two or 3% of the, yeah. If this is a hundred milliseconds here, the context switch might be two or three milliseconds, but that really adds up, okay? The context switch is a very non-trivial amount of time. So if you have CPU bound processes, you really want to run them with long time quantums. So that's the motivation for time quantums getting longer and longer and longer. As things get more CPU bound and you're really confident that they're really CPU bound, you want them to be down here with really long time quantums so that you're not wasting time switching between CPU bound, CPU bound, CPU bound, CPU bound. You, in the extreme case, you could even just say at some point, just run process one till it's done, run process two till it's done, run process three till it's done. Actually, some books said that, but that's actually wrong. Some books actually said that when you get down to this level here, instead of doing round robin, you do first come, first serve. Okay. I, I found a couple books that actually say, oh, on the bottom level, you can do first come, first serve. Tell me what's wrong with that. They shouldn't have said that. It kind of almost amounts to it, but there's a bit of a problem. What would be wrong? with using first come first serve down here. So you run him till he's done, then you run him till he's done, then you run him till he's done. And it's assuming that nobody else is up here. What if you have a really long CPU bound process and right behind it is a short one? Well, none of them are short because they're all, C you know, they managed to get their way down here. So you're on the right track. Okay, they, they managed to get down here. So none of them are short. So, so, you know, so exaggerate your example a little bit, exaggerate it, and then you have the right answer. What's wrong with run him till he's done, run him till he's done, run him till he's done? Take that answer and exaggerate it. If the first one is extremely long, and then the second exaggerate. one- Exaggerate, what's extremely long? An hour. More longer than that. Five hours. More longer than that. 15 hours. Eternity. What do I mean by eternity? It never finishes. Yeah, it's an infinite. What if that process happens to be in an infinite loop? We never know when a program might be in an infinite loop. Then you really have a problem. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Even if it was like a, this was a 15 hour job and this is a 10 hour job, there's no reason for him to wait for this guy to be finished. But the real problem with first come first serve is 
one of these might actually be an infinite loop. It might be a buggy piece of software that nobody realized. So if it turned out to be an infinite program, none of these would ever get to run. You would run this one until somebody else came in that needed an IO operation. Then when somebody's IO operation, you go back to him. And these guys would really starve. Okay. So there is the possibility that one program is buggy and it's in an infinite loop. So it would run forever. So you would you would never do first come first serve down here because of that problem. Now it actually would still be bad because this could be a 15 hour job and a five hour job and a five hour job. There's really no reason to make this these two five hour jobs wait 15 hours. You know, you'd be better off running them with long time slices. You'd be better off running them with just some very long time slice. You're, the time slice could be half a second or a second long. You could be running them with very long time slices. Okay. All right. All right. So I, I was real surprised when I found a couple textbooks that said, oh, you could use first come, first serve down here. That would be a really bad answer. It, your intuition is that these long running jobs, it almost doesn't matter, but that would be assuming that you knew that none of them were first, uh, you, you knew that none of them had an infinite loop, and also that you didn't have one that took 100 hours while the other three took three hours each. Yeah, then it'd be kind of nuts to run the 100 hour job while the three hour job here waited. Those would still be very long running, but there'd be a huge difference between them. Okay, so it's still gonna be round robin down here, but with maybe a very long time quantum. Okay, All right, now let's see. So you, everybody agrees that the time quantums increase. Everyone agrees that if you use up a time slice, you drop down a level. Where there's disagreement is what to do when you come out of an IO operation. Oh, okay. And everybody agrees that at some point in time, you boost everybody up to the top level. So that's what everyone agrees on. Multiple levels, increasing, increasing time quantums. When you use up a time quantum, you drop down a level. At some point in time, everybody gets brought up to the top. Okay. Where they disagree is what, do you, what happens when you come out of an IO operation? You could go straight to the top. You could go up one level from where you were. Either of those I think are about the same. I don't think there's a huge difference between whether you go up one level when you come out of an IO operation or if you go straight to the top. Because if you're gonna be IO bound, you're gonna rise to the top anyway. The other possibility is you stay at the same level. I think that's kind of weird. Uh, I don't, but maybe that turns out to have been efficient in, in, in the real world when they implemented it, maybe it turned out to be not a bad idea. So one possibility is that when you come out of the IO operation, you go back to the same queue you were in, okay? So if you use up a time slice, you go down, but if you do an IO operation, you stay in the same place you were in, okay? But I think what makes sense to me is if you finish an IO operation, you're, you're, you're looking IO bound, you should go up. At least go up one level, maybe even go up to the top, okay? All right, now, so, that's all there is to this algorithm. It works really beautifully. Now let's look at Windows, okay? If um, if I download this folder of stuff on scheduling, where did I put it? I should move. I should move this folder up to the top because you have to look for it now. It's drifted kind of down the page. I should move that up to the top. So if you if you download that folder, there's some notes about scheduling in there. Um, we, we, we briefly looked at this the other day. Here's what's here's here's an example of one operating system. This gives you a sense of what the time quantums were like. Uh, notice here, high priorities, high number, low priorities, low number. This is what this is the world that used one ordering. High number meant higher priority, lower number meant lower priority. See, that's got the long time quantums. OK, so the longer time quantums are, are actually the lowest priority. So the Q, you know, this is the queue that you, you, know, you work on processes in this queue until you go until it's empty. And then you go to the process in this queue and the time quantums get longer. OK. OK, 
Now, the equivalent for Windows was not that picture. Oh, this picture. Windows. Windows makes things a little bit more complicated. I, mean, I saw that with fork and create process. Windows makes everything a little bit more complicated. Processes run in a band of priorities. Here, a process could start here at a priority 59 and basically just work its way down to zero. And then if, and then if it got, it did, you know, if it, as it was compute bound, it would work its way all the way down here. Then as it started doing IO operations, it would either jump up to here. I don't know if this one made you jump all the way to the top or if you worked your way up but processes could work their way back and forth through this whole range. Windows processes stay within a certain range. A Windows process is either high, above normal, normal, below normal, or idle. And it means it stays within that range of, of priorities. So it will not go up, you know, this one will not go to that level. A process that's in this band will stay within, it's, it's, it's cues from the point of view of From the point of view of this picture, its cues are banded. You know. Okay. So yeah, if you if you know you have you actually have 32 of these cues. So Windows has 32 of these cues, but any process moves within a band of those cues. It will not just keep dropping down to the bottom and then go all the way back up to the top. When it drops, it drops to there. Then when it goes up, it goes back up to there. Then when it drops, it drops back down to there. This process in this range go from here to here. And notice that the range is overlap. So it's, it gets kind of messy. So any one queue, see like this queue here has actually got some processes from this range and some processes from this range. Notice that the any one queue overlaps with two ranges. So they only have two. So in this queue, there's some processes that from this range so for example, in this queue here, that process can go up one, but a process from this queue in, well, a process from this band in that queue can't go up. It can, it just stays there, yeah. A process from this queue in this band can go up, okay. Similarly, like this one here, this, a process from this queue can't go down, but a process from the same queue, but this band can go down in priority. Oh, and, and Windows priority is like Linux. Zero is the lowest priority. And so here they're numbering low priority, which is the, the long time slices up to high priority, which is the very short time slices. Then to make things even weirder, Windows doesn't even use 16 through 31. I mentioned that the other day, 16 through 31 exist, but are never used. That was a failed attempt at Windows to provide something called a real-time operating system. They never wrote it. They never wrote the real-time operating system. So they built something into Windows that they ended up never using. So they only use the range from zero up to 30, up to 15, okay? They only use ranges from zero up to 15, okay? That's this one here, okay? So in, in, re, in reality, they're never using 16 through 31, okay? So the quirky thing here is that you processes only work within that range, okay? Now. Here's a page in their documentation that kind of verifies what they're doing here. Okay. They're talking about priority boost, how a process moves in these ranges. So this is where Microsoft has a web page where they say a little bit about this. Okay. And they're essentially describing the multi-level feedback queue. Okay. So like here. Like this is the one we've been working on. When a wait condition for a block process are satisfied. So when you come out of the wait, when the wait condition for a block thread are satisfied, the scheduler boosts the priority of the thread. Okay, so you go up to what from what you were. For example, when a wait operation associated with this, the thread receives a priority boost. Now they don't say how much. So I'm thinking that they're doing probably just up one. Yeah, they, they don't say how much they boost it by. 
So it could very well be that they're one of the ones that where when you come out of the IO operation, you go up one level. I, bet, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what they mean here. Since they just say priority boost, they probably mean you go up from whatever level you were to one above it. So in terms of their picture here, you know, if you come out of an IO operation, you go up one. Now there's other places where you can get a priority boost, okay? Okay. This is almost the same thing. When a Windows, when um, here, this was specifically about IO operations. What we haven't really talked about is there are other reasons why you can be blocked over here. You don't have to be blocked just because of an IO operation. Our textbook always uses IO operations as the idea for when you block. But you can be blocked waiting for somebody to click on a GUI item. So that's not, it's, te it's technically it's IO. You're waiting for mouse input. Yeah. So you're waiting for that. Okay. So this tab was waiting for me to click on it, to, to, to show itself. Like this tab is waiting for me to click on it. Okay. So those are, in a sense, this tab is blocked. There's no work being done inside this tab right now. The tab that's hidden from me is not doing anything. It's in a blocked state. Where is the, oh, it's in the other tab. It, this, the tab that's hidden from you is in a blocked state. When you click, it unblocks and it can do something. Okay, that's just to save resources. There's, if you have a bunch of tabs open, there's no point work being done on the tabs that you can't see. So the browser blocks the tabs that you don't see. Now, technically that's waiting for an IO operation. You're waiting for mouse, but here it's thought of as something different. It's thought of when a window receives input. Okay, mouse, see, mouse messages. Okay, the scheduler boosts the priority of the thread. Okay, now in a sense, you can lump those together. They're both IO operations. But in a sense, from Windows point of view, this, this one's a little bit special because it's a GUI operating system. So it's treating these as kind of as different than IO. And in some places in the operating system, GUI operations are treated differently than IO operations. That's what we want to get to. What I want to show you that in, in Windows, there is a sense that when you're blocked on the GUI, that's not the same thing as being blocked on I.O. Because it's a GUI-based operating system, it does treat them as a little bit differently. Every GUI operation is an I.O. operation because it involves either the mouse or the keyboard. So here I'm going to switch tabs by my keyboard. So my mouse is over here. I'm not going to, but I'm going to just switch tabs by my, I'm right now I'm hitting control, I'm hitting control tab. So it could either be a keyboard input or a mouse input that switches from tabs, but it is an IO operation. Okay. But somehow, you know, there's a certain gooiness to those IO operations, the keyboard and the mouse that's different than waiting on the hard drive or the, uh, inter the network interface card. So Windows treats those slightly differently. And here's one thing that it does. I, um, besides there being a priority boost, I couldn't find real good documentation on this, but there's also something called a quantum boost. See if I get um think it's there quantum boosting yeah this is microsoft's documentation this is that book on windows internals this is the online version of the chapter on threads in the book on windows internals okay so there's something called quantum boosting okay what quantum boosting does it only does this for GUI operations. When you come out of a GUI operation, you get a priority boost, but you also get a longer time quantum than what this queue would normally have. Okay, so for a GUI operation, you get both a quantum, a, a, you get both a priority boost and a quantum boost. You get a slightly longer time quantum than everybody else in that. Now that can only go to one process. So for example, let me show what I mean. I'm gonna launch two CMDs. I'm gonna launch three CMDs.
from the point of view of Windows, one of these CMDs is more important than the other. This one is in the foreground. It's the one that gets keyboard input. It is only one process can be in the foreground. Out of all the processes I'm running, only one can be the top level window. It gets a time quantum boost. It's the foreground process. So when now, like, like right now, when I go here, any process running in that window gets a little longer time quantum than these other processes. Whatever process is in that window gets a little longer time quantum. So for example, if I ran, if I were to do this with the create, pro, um, if I were to go back to the homework three folder, I think I closed it. If I went back to the homework three folder and I launched several uh, command windows here, and I ran create this, um, Compute process, run it with say 200. Now you can't see it, but that one's getting longer time quantums than this one would be getting. You can't see it. Now this one's getting the longer time quantums. Now this one's getting the longer time quantums. You can't see it, but it, but that's internally, that's what Windows is doing. This guy's getting slightly longer time quantums than that guy is because he is the foreground process he's living in this window now he's not a gooey process but it's still the case that he is the foreground process now normally the foreground process would be a gooey process like my browser but it not it doesn't have to be windows still gives this guy a quantum boost because he is in the window that's in the foreground okay okay now he gets the slightly longer time quantum you used to actually be able to see the time quantums like 10 years ago when program computers were slower. I could, I was able to, I used to be able to do experiments where you could see the longer time quantum in this window than in this window. But those experiments don't work anymore. It's just a quirk, you know, the computers are too fast these days. But it used to be you could actually see that this process, you could, I could actually run a little, I could do a little trick where you could see longer time quantums here than in this one here. But you can't see it anymore. It just, the, the trick doesn't work anymore. But this process is getting a longer time quantum. Okay. I don't know why that other process went away. That's weird. That's like some kind of little Windows trick. And I went, oh, you don't see me moving this around either. I think if I think I think uh, Zoom stops you from seeing me move this around. Okay. So there we is can see both, it. pardon me? We can see it when you move that around. If I if if I move it around slowly, I, I think. Yeah, maybe if you did it a little faster, it wouldn't show it. Yeah, there I'm moving it real still fast. Showing it. Oh, good. Maybe they changed something, you know, because before it wouldn't. It's being maybe a little laggy, but okay. Now we're, we're seeing it. Okay. So Windows has both priority boosts and quantum boosts. But the quantum boosts are only for the GUI program. It's actually for only one process. A whole bunch of processes can get the priority. The priority boost is any process that finishes an I.O. operation. Anything that finishes an I.O. operation gets a priority boost. That just means it moves up. It moves up one notch in this range here. But the quantum boost is only for the one process that is the foreground process. It gets the quantum boost. Okay. And I don't know if, if it says here what the links of the time quantums are. Okay. All right. So we run out of time. So that pretty much covers the whole, that finishes, that's the last thing to say about the, uh, the scheduling algorithms. You know, the, our textbook never mentions the quantum boosts because the quantum boosts were mostly for GUI based operating systems. An operating system that's an old, an old fashioned operating system, like, a, like a, a database server, which doesn't run any GUI programs, it only runs the database system, it doesn't, it doesn't need quantum boosting, it doesn't have any GUI programs. The quantum burst was really to make, what, what it was trying to do is make this work better. If, if this tab is suddenly gonna be open, it may actually need to do quite a bit of work to display itself. So it needs more than a priority boost, it may actually need a quantum boost. That was the, that's where it comes from. 
it's that when you switch to a background window and also make it a foreground window, it may actually need a, a more CPU resources to make itself presentable. Okay, so not only when you switch to like this, not only do you get a quantum boost, but you, you get not only do you get a priority boost, but you get a quantum boost. Okay, the process that becomes the foreground process gets a little bit longer time. It stays in that same queue, but that one process in that queue actually has a longer time quantum than the other processes in that queue. Okay, okay. so that's everything about scheduling that we want to talk about. So we'll go ahead and quit there. Let me see. Today's Wednesday. So the uh, if you. I say earlier, if you have questions about the homework assignment, send me emails. Uh, it's going to take me a while to get through to all of them. I'm I'm trying to answer the emails, but you know, don't feel bad if you want to send me another one. If you sent me an email with a question, you have another question, keep sending the emails. I'll try to get through answering them. But right now, I just have a lot of a lot of classes and a lot of students. You know, it it just takes it's going to take me a few days to get through them all. Okay, all right. So I'll go ahead and quit there. Anybody have any last second question? Any last second question? Okay, so have a nice weekend. Bye.